throughout all Christian history, in every generation, there's a new philosophical movement that attacks Christian faith and truth claims. And so in every generation, the faith must be defended. And we are called to give an intellectual apologia, a reply to those alternate uh, life views that assail the Christian faith. I mean, unlike every other religion in the world, we have evidence, we have reason. They do not change anybody's heart. They do not convince anybody. They do not help us to evangelize or to witness. They, they don't do any of these things. Hondo! Hondo! up everybody uh, Norman Geisler was big about God being purely rational no irrationality in God at all but what is reason reason is just a process of thinking you begin with some beliefs and then reason draws conclusions from uh, these beliefs you begin with knowledge and then you draw conclusions But if God created reason, and he is only reasonable, he is only rational, then that means he is contained within what he created, which is impossible. The whole idea that God is rational, it means that if we are rational enough, we can understand everything about God. And this is what Geiser believed. He even tried to describe the Trinity. Which, I mean, if you read it, it's 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 a joke. Honestly, it's it just made it made me laugh. If God created reason, and He is only rational. Then He is subject to reason. Meaning, there's this again. There's this hierarchy. We have reason, and it tells us everything about the universe, including God. So God is less than reason. But God is both rational and, and irrational because we cannot understand him. He is beyond reason. I think a better word would be supra, supra rational. Or super rational. Super rational means like extra rational. I don't think that's the right word. These guys are very dangerous because, again, if reason is the authority, then everything that God says is subject to reason. The word of God is subject to reason. And, and of course, this is what guys did believe. Statements about God are subject to logic. This is what he said in his systematic theology. But that's that means that we can decide what's true and false about the Bible. We can decide everything about the Bible. And this is what Brandon Robertson believes. This is what the Catholics believe. This is what... Of course, all the cults believe. And we have all these guys springing up these days. And what amazes me is R.C. Sprawl. He was a big Thomas. I mean, he was solid in everything except this. And he loved he loved Norma Geisler. It was just he just adored all his books. It was like a little comments on every one of Geisler's books. But it's completely it's just completely wrong he was completely wrong on this and he would say presuppositionalism just because it's new is false and this is in his apologetics book with Gerstner but presuppositionalism is not new the word is new but just because the word is new doesn't mean the idea that it describes is new John Gill, and I was looking to see if, if, we could, if I could find this in any of the older books, and John Calvin talks about it. He doesn't use the word presuppositionalism, but he says we cannot, we, we cannot as men justify or give reason why we believe. We cannot use our reason to justify our faith. And we have evidence, of course, but that is not the foundation for faith in the scripture. And he says that this is, again, this is what the Catholics do. 
And since they do that, they can decide everything about Scripture, everything about doctrine. The Church is the authority. This is what the Catholics believe. But again, Sproul said that presuppositionalism was new and therefore false. Because the truth comes from God, from the Word of God, from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has always been with us. So if something comes up and it's new, you should be very suspicious. But this is new at all. John Gill in a body of doctrinal divinity, divinity back in the uh, 1600s. I think it's 16. He was born in 1697. He was a Baptist. Some, because the being of God is a first principle, meaning our first belief, the first thing that we understand that we know to be true, which is not to be disputed. And because of that, there is one, is a self-evident proposition not to be disproved, have thought it should not be admitted as a matter of debate. Not new. Presuppositionalism is not new. And then he quotes in the footnotes Aristotle. So Aristotle says, Every problem and proposition is not to be disputed. They that doubt whether God is to be worshipped and parents loved are to be punished and not disputed with. We do not argue whether or not God exists. Clearly he exists. The world exists. The heavens declare the glory of God. Paul says, God made it evident within them that he exists and that we owe him. Well, editing this video, I found something that, again, is just really basically blasphemous. Can God transcend logic as he does natural law? Now, keep in mind, God is sovereign over everything. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. At any time he can alter or change or not change what happens, including all the thoughts and the desires of men. Yet at the same time, we are free. We choose what we want to choose. We choose what we desire. There is nothing that coerces us. So this, these two things, they don't make sense. And so this is the this is the problem that Norman Geisler had in the face of logic and God's sovereignty facing these two things that that seem to contradict each other he chose to abandon everything scripture said about sovereignty about providence about God ordaining everything that comes to pass out the window so this is what he said some have suggested that since God made natural law and can transcend it by supernatural intervention, it would seem to follow that he can do the same with the rational laws he has made. In short, if God can break his laws of physics, why can't he break his laws of rationality? The response to this is that God did not make or create the laws of thought any more than he created himself. The laws of reason are based on God's uncreated nature. So the laws of reason are uncreated, just like God. They're equal to God in his eternal nature. What the hell is wrong with this guy? So that was Norman Geisler. His God. His first God was reason. God have, could have created a world, a language, a way of thought that had no basis at all in sense, in reason, in logic. I mean, the very fact that the world is orderly suggests that God created order he created orderly thought i don't see how any of you guys can like this guy right? he's basically a pagan basically a pagan reason is god second is god the true god is second the, the number one god the highest god for norman geisler was reason and logic uncreated eternal not subject to anything that's God. R.C. Sprawl. You know, Greg Bonson had a debate with R.C. Sprawl, and I should watch it, but I think it would just irritate me. John Calvin. So R.C. Sprawl used John Calvin to say that presuppositionalism is not new. 
This is John Calvin in the Institutes of the Christian Religion talking about um, the authority of Scripture, why we believe it's true, and why the Catholics, what their problem is. The knowledge of God. This is the Robert White edition. Many people commit the fatal error of believing that Scripture has only such value as the Church agrees to accord it, as if God's eternal and inviolable truth depended on men's good pleasure. For they ask, not without great offense to the Holy Spirit, who can prove to us that Scripture is from God? Who can assure us that it has been preserved whole until our own day? Who can persuade us that one book is to be received and obeyed and another rejected? Unless the Church makes a positive ruling in all such things. Unless the Church determines the authority of Scripture. The Church says we should believe it. Because whatever, evidence, reason... Accordingly, they conclude that it is for the church to determine what reverence we owe scripture and what books go to make it up. In this way, these blasphemers seeking to impose a monstrous tyranny under cover of the church are indifferent to the absurdities in which they trap themselves and others, as long as they can convince the ignorant that the church is free to do anything it pleases. This is the church giving it authority to scripture, not just accepting and believing the authority that it declares, but saying, we declare the church but saying we declare scripture authoritative therefore now you can believe it and so when they do that it means that they can say whatever whatever scripture means we now interpret scripture because we are the ones who determined that it was true in the first place again in this way these blasphemers seeking to impose a monstrous tyranny under cover of the church are indifferent to the absurdities in which they trap themselves and others as long as they can convince the ignorant that the church is free to do anything it pleases. Now, if that were the case, what would become of those poor consciences which seek a firm assurance of eternal life? If they learned that all such promises rested solely on the judgment of men, if that was what they thought, how could they stop wavering and trembling? Then, too, would not our faith be exposed to the jeers of unbelievers? Would it not appear suspects in the world's eyes? If people thought that it was built on the favor and goodwill of men. These liars, however, are easily refuted by Paul's single statement that the church is established on the foundation of the prophets and apostles. Ephesians 2.20 And I'll add to that Hebrews 6. I think it's 12. For when God could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. God's word is authoritative, authoritative because he said it is. And all we can do is accept it. 6.13 For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. Not by the evidence of the church, not by any reasonable confirmation that we created. And again, Matthew 7. He who, he who hears these words of mine. I think it's Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came. The winds blew again. The winds blew and slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. The rock of the Word of God is the foundation. Now again, we have many apologetic, rational, and scientific evidences. And that's fine. They are not the ground for our faith. They are not the ground for why we believe that Scripture is true. God gives this to us when he changes our hearts the entire notion of apologetics is kind of bizarre at least the way that we think about it they we we believe that apologetics is to defend christianity and tell people why we believe it's true for unbelievers they're not going to believe it's true no matter what we do because they're sinners because they're dead in sin because they're unable to understand spiritual things. This is 1 Corinthians 2. They refuse to, Romans 8. They're incapable 
of understanding spiritual things. They're incapable of believing that Christianity is true until they become a Christian. But when they become a Christian, there's no reason to believe that because they know it. God has changed their hearts and they just know by faith. And I think for most people, those of us who are non-intellectuals and are not obsessed with knowledge and understanding every single thing that happens in the world, then that's fine. We don't need all of this evidence. I know my, my mother's not like this. I know a lot of people who, who never studied politics, but they're solid believers. I was not a solid believer, so I needed evidence when I was in high school. And that's fine. But when but but it doesn't give us faith. It, and it doesn't convince unbelievers by any means. And the verse in Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 31. It's in a couple places in Jeremiah and also in Ezekiel. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again. Each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, say, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And in Romans, Paul says it is by the word of God preached, not by apologetics, that we become Christians. So, I mean, unlike every other religion in the world, we have evidence, we have reason. They do not change anybody's heart. They do not convince anybody. They do not help us to evangelize or to witness. They, they don't do any of these things. 